This is the second iteration of our webinar series, Latinx Health Strategies, um, and specifically on our Luchad campaign, Latino Health Priorities in a Post-COVID World. Um, we are going to be talking about some of the stories that have built the foundation. These are stories from you all, from our communities that we have been traveling across the U.S. and gathering um, and hearing from you and hearing what your struggles are during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're also just so excited to be able to share with you what we've used and what we've compiled in result of all your stories. Luchad is just the next step in a way to address these health priorities that you have already identified. Um, and so I will, without further ado, just talk about some of these health priorities that we wanted to highlight in this webinar specifically. So what is Luchad? Um, and I will allow my colleague, Paulina Sosa, our CEO and founder, to describe it in more detail. However, I just wanted to give us a little snippet and say that Luchad is an acronym that stands for Leading and Uniting Comunidades Through Health and Awareness Resources. Today, we'll be focusing on three specific health topics, worker health, infectious disease, and border health. And we'll have lovely speakers to speak on each of these issues. But why are these issues specifically and most importantly, most impacting our Latino community? Um, just to share some high level data points, by 2030, Latinos will make up one fifth of workers in the labor force, which is nearly 36 million people. I think we've been hearing a lot about this in the news and also just seeing it for ourselves in the communities that Latinos are hard workers and they are a majority of the people who put food on our table and are working in the field and in other industries just to make sure that the world keeps spinning and our economy keeps building. So they are an essential part of our workforce that needs to be kept healthy and to take care of, not just in the workforce, but at home and how that transitions from family to family and for generations to come because Latinos are not going away. We know this, we are seeing it and living it every day. So we really wanna take time to talk about why Latinos should be taken care of in the workforce specifically. Secondly, we wanted to highlight um, as of 2023, Latinos have made up 18.9% of population and they were about 25% or 24% of COVID-19 cases overall. And these data come from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, Latinos were very heavily impacted by COVID-19 as you've probably known from your own personal experiences and as well as just seeing it a lot in media and in the news, we are a vulnerable population that needs special care, not just you know one-on-one, -on -one, but also culturally. We need to think about why is there vaccine hesitancy for our populations and why are we getting sicker and why are we the first to get sick often compared to our other uh, groups in different race ethnicities. Secondly, or sorry, thirdly, I want to talk about the recent data show that about 90% of residents in the Texas-Mexico border region are Latino. This isn't a totally startling statistic. However, it's important to know why this population needs to be taken care of, specifically in a cultural aspect, but also how can we talk about ways that we can keep them safe as our families are on the border, whether they're going across the border or if they're just trying to live their lives in Texas or in Mexico, and why is it specifically a dangerous region? I wanted to, her picture is not showing up here for some reason, but her lovely face is with us in the spotlights. Paulina Sosa is our founder and CEO of Latinx Voices and Task Force. Uh, she currently works at the CME, as CIMI coordinator at the Smithsonian um, for the CIMI program under Access Smithsonian. Smithsonian, I apologize. It's a program focused on using art to engage with Alzheimer's or dementia patients and their caregivers. Um, as you all probably are very familiar with um, Latinx Voices has taken a large part of Paulina's time, but she also dedicates her time uh, to the CME coordinator position. Um, and this is because of her 15 years of public health, including advocacy, data analytics, communication. Um, I could go on. She's been heavily involved with the American Public Health Association, as well um, as with the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization in the past 15 years. And so thank you, Paulina, for joining us and for giving us a little snippet more about the Luchar campaign.
Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Carmen Martinez. Uh, she joins us from Centro de los Derechos del Migrante. She is a partnerships coordinator with this organization, and she develops and maintains partnerships primarily for CDM's health initiatives work, and also coordinates the Migration That Works Coalition, uh, which advocates for stronger protections for migrant workers. So she will be speaking heavily on the labor workforce and why this is important for our Latino group specifically, and how we can protect the health, the health of those workers. And thirdly, I get to introduce uh, Charisse, um, who is joining us from Vaccinate Your Family. Uh, as the Advocacy and Education Director at Vaccinate Your Family, Charisse is responsible for cultivating, empowering, and mobilizing and supporting a diverse network of patient advocates who've been personally impacted by vaccine-preventable diseases and overseeing the development of educational programming. Um, she also uh, serves as the Vaccinate Your Family Staff Influenza subject matter expert and represents the organization on flu-related coalitions. So uh, not only is she here as a uh, content expert, but she also has her own personal story that really fuels her passion for advocacy in this field, which she will touch on in her own presentation. Um, but so those are our speakers in a very speedy way, but um, I wanted to just pass the floor to Paulina, who will be giving us a little more in-depth context on the Luchar campaign, and then um, a high-level discussion on why this is specifically important for Latinos. So take it away, Paulina. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And a big thank you to everyone that is here with us today. I've had a chance to just kind of see where everyone's calling in from. And we have such a diversity of participants joining us today from across the country and across the fields in health and in public health. So a big thank you for being with us here today. And I'm also happy to say that many of you that were with us along the Juntos y Podemos tour this past year and a half will be very, very, um, we'll, we'll see some familiar slides and content in here knowing that a lot of the work that we did to create Luchad actually really comes from the stories and the work that we did together with you. So as Alejandra mentioned, um, I'm here to really talk about what Luchad is, right? A lot of us are hearing this term over and over and over. And so we're just so excited to be able to share this with you, unveil this with you, but more importantly, to roll this out together with you. As, as anyone in this call can say, we are a very big believer in the power of partnership and collaboration. So moving forward, we cannot do this without you. So let's, let's learn a little more about who we are. For those of us on the call that are not as familiar with the Latinx Task Force, we are the health branch of Latinx Voces. And as the health focus of the organization, our mission is specifically to address health disparities and improve access to health information in the Latino community through education. There's that word partnership again, and community. We cannot do it without these three pillars. So fast forwarding to what is Luchad? What is this initiative we keep talking about? And who is this cute little mascot that we have on the screen? So Luchad Health is an initiative launched by the Latinx Task Force in collaboration with our over 300 partners from across the country. And for those of you that are on the call who are like, wait, I want to be a part of this, let us know in the chat. There are definitely ways for you to continue to be a part of the work that we're doing in this initiative. So we're addressing 10 key health priorities that were identified by, by communities, community health leaders, and Latino specific organizations across the country. So those health priorities, those challenges, and most importantly, the solutions to addressing these challenges in the Latino community. As you can see, Luchad does stand for leading and uniting comunidades through health awareness and resources. So it's really meant to be this compilation of health resources post COVID, right? We were in the middle of a two and a half, three year pandemic together. And there were a lot of challenges and a lot of barriers that were brought to light. But as many of us know, these barriers have existed for decades, right? And so what we wanna make sure Luchad can do is continue the momentum specifically for Latino health priorities 
moving into this post COVID world with the health equity agenda we keep hearing so much about. So these are the topics that are currently included in Luchat. We have border health, chronic disease, domestic violence, elderly health, immigrant health, infectious disease, maternal and child health, mental health, which is a big one, of course, sexual health, and worker health. So today we are talking specifically with two of our partners, we're specifically talking about worker health and infectious disease or vaccine preventable disease. And it is built on the foundation of culture, language, and community, right? Because the Latino community is not monolithic. It is not one culture. It is not one language. It's not even one Spanish dialect, right? Across the country in this tour, we saw Latino communities differing so much in one city like Miami. There's anyone in the call from Miami, you all know, right? Any Anyone here in Texas knows that a city in San Antonio, Texas, is going to be very different from a community in Lubbock, Texas, or in the Rio Grande Valley. Or maybe we have Colorado. I saw Colorado here on the call. I know we have California. We have D.C. Latino communities are not the same. And so we must rely on understanding the culture and the language of that community. And the only way we can do this is with the community that is on the ground. We can only do this together with community leaders, promotores, that are directly on the ground working with families one-on-one. -on -one. And so from this really centerpiece of, of Luchad and the centerpiece of the foundation, we have policy, data, and funding. And again, we know that only with an understanding, a true understanding of the community's needs, can we really understand what kind of policy recommendations we can make, what kind of data is needed, right? We know that there is a lot of missing data to truly address the needs of our community. And then of course, to make sure that we are dispersing the proper funds and resources for nuestra comunidad. So this goes, takes us a little bit to our roots. Um, again, for those of you that were on the tour, feel free to put a, a thumb up or to say hello in the chat. It's so good to see you because we couldn't have done this without your feedback and without your stories. So we went across uh, really five states. We have Puerto Rico as well. You don't see it because it's so small here on the map but we were able to hear from stories and communities across the country. And um, we were able to do this at health clinics, city fairs, local festivals, and we really got in there with the community. We worked together with community leaders, with partners. We talked with families. We have platicas con familias, right? Because they're the ones who know exactly what they're experiencing. And so um, we do have a little video. I'm not going to share it here, but You'll see that it's also on our website. And this tour was really not just about outreach. As you can see what from what I'm saying here, this tour was all about conversation and engagement to really come to the crux of what those foundational pillars are, what those solutions are, and how we can truly address and continue to sustainably address Latino health priorities in our community. So what did the tour entail? It, of course, I entailed identifying communities. And honestly, there are so many communities that we still want to visit, right? We didn't see a good example is Chicago, Illinois in here, right? We didn't see New York City in here. There are a number of cities that we still want to do. So even though the tour with Juntos y Podemos during the pandemic did come to a close in May this year, we still want to continue touring and hopefully we'll be able to come to your community to hear your story if we haven't already had the chance to. But identifying those communities was key. Developing key partnerships, again, I'm gonna keep saying it with promotores, community leaders and community health organizations on the ground, listening to the communities, sitting down and really engaging and hearing what the issues on the ground have been and listening to the needs of partners, right? And so in many cases, we did work with local health departments the local health departments helped us engage with those local clinics or those churches that serve as trusted messengers in the community, right? And so this is really a huge network of collaboration and partnership and engagement that we had to do in order to really understand what is Miami, Florida needing? What is San Antonio, Texas needing? What is Arizona, different parts of Arizona needing, right? And so really understanding that really really entailed community engagement. And then of course, implementing those stories and implementing those high level themes into what we are now calling 
Salute Chat Health Initiative. So we had storytelling, we had community, and we had partnership. And so I'm gonna go ahead, I know I have a couple minutes and I really want us to have a chance to hear two of those big, big health priorities um, from Carmen and Cerise here. Um, but I just wanna make a call to action because I know that with us being in this call today, that already says that we are standing together with not only this initiative, but with the work that many of you are already doing on the ground. And so first, I just wanna say, I salute you and I thank you for the work you continue to do. And we as a task force look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. But we do have one more webinar coming up in this series. And I wanna just ask that you save the date. And Alejandro will also be giving more information at the end of the webinar because we're gonna talk about how is this, how is Smooth Chat really gonna look in 2024? And we want you all there. We want you to be part of this conversation because it's gonna be a collaborative effort. We also wanna hear your story. So if we haven't had a chance to sit with you yet, to talk with you, to hear what worked for you, what lessons learned or best practices you have from working in the pandemic, we wanna hear from you. So definitely please, please share your story with us or please reach out directly to me and I'd love to just sit on a call with you and chat a little more. We also wanna invite you to visit the Luchad Health website. It is live already. We do have our four topics live. We have worker health, infectious disease, as well as immigrant health and border health. And we'd love to get your feedback on the website. We're hoping that it's super user-friendly and easy to see all of the different resources and information on these topics. And of course, we invite you to show your support for Luchad because this is gonna continue to be an effort into 2024. One last thing I'll say is we have a number of different ways to join our efforts. We have our, our Luchad Health campaign you can sign up for, but we also wanna invite you to the Task Force Coalition. I know many of you are our partners already and it's so good to see you. And for those of you that are not partners with us yet, this is an open coalition. So join us today if you're interested. And with that, I'll pass the floor over to Alejandra. I'm so excited to hear more from our speakers and hear more from you. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Paulina. That was an excellent overview. And I really appreciate you going deep into really describing how we've gotten here and why we're launching Luchad and why it's so important for everyone to get involved. So thank you. Now I will pass the mic to our lovely Carmen Martinez to talk about worker health. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, I will share my screen. Um... As Alejandra mentioned, my name is Carmen Martinez. I uh, am partnerships coordinator with CDM. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about worker health. Um, give me one second, uh, make sure I am perfect. Um, so I um, work with CDM, Centro de los Derechos del Migrante. For those of you that um, don't know Spanish, that's Center for Migrant Rights. We were founded in 2005 um, with the primary um, goal is to overcome uh, the border as a barrier for justice for migrant workers. Um, we've uh, worked traditionally with uh, this population, migrant workers coming from other countries, primarily Mexico in our case, um, to the US to uh, work on temporary work visas in industries such as agriculture and other seasonal industries, including landscaping, seafood, um, and others. And so our mission has really been to um, improve access to justice for this population um, and doing so by doing outreach to uh, sending communities in Mexico um, to provide legal support if folks are um, facing issues at work once they're in the U.S. Um, to help people avoid fraud um, when they're hearing about work opportunities um, in, in their communities. Um, and so um, our aim is really to help people um, be be safe at work. Um, so we do have a focus in occupational health and safety as well. A little bit more about um, our model. Um, so I mentioned we do outreach. Um, we do also leadership development um, to prepare workers to confront challenges in the workplace. Um, we have worker comites, um, whereby um, we are um, providing a space to hear from workers, um, to hear what they think could be uh, improvements to overall the um, work programs, the international work visa programs. 
Um, we're also doing advocacy work, um, accompanying workers again in addressing any injustices in their workplace, um, as well as doing advocacy on the Hill um, with coalitions, so multi-stakeholder coalitions with other advocates around the, the country who have also noticed uh, deep flaws within um, these uh, work visa programs. Um, and finally, we're also um, deeply um, value data um, in, in helping inform our priorities, um, uh, particularly um, hearing workers' voices in, in what the solutions are to the issues that we're seeing um, in these programs and, um, and also um, being part of that feedback loop in our partnership. So both hearing from workers and from our partners, as well as making sure we're also um, passing along the messages to other folks that we work with, such as the, the CDC and other local health departments. So now um, to the focus of the webinar, um, we did uh, uh, draft a portion really led by my colleague, uh, Julia Coburn, um, to talk a little bit about worker health and why it's important overall to public health. And so just to provide a common definition, um, public health is an area of public health whose purpose is to ensure that workers in all occupations enjoy the highest degree of physical, mental, and social well-being. So when we think about worker health, we're addressing topics such as workplace hazards and environmental exposures. Um, think about like, you know, indoor air quality, heat and cold stress. Um, we're thinking about chemicals and um, guidance to properly and safely use and dispose of chemicals. We're also talking about diseases and injuries a big one the past couple of years, right? Um, how to protect ourselves from getting COVID um, and other infectious diseases, other ergonomic and musculoskeletal disorders, for example. Um, we're also thinking about safety and prevention. So the proper use of PPE, personal protective equipment, as well as emergency preparedness, industry control. So thinking about how to uh, design the workplace so that workers are healthy and safe. Um, and uh, the CDC's uh, NIOSH, National, Institutional, National Institution for Occupational Safety and Health, also promotes this approach called the total, health, total worker health approach, um, which is defined as policies and programs, practices that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with the promotion of injury and illness prevention efforts to advance worker well-being. So it builds on these, this traditional occupational safety and health programs by recognizing that work itself is a social determinant of health um, with broader familial community and social public health implications. So this approach also considers, for example, the role that scheduling, for example, or pay and benefits structures play in worker and broader, broader social well-being. Um, and, uh, before I, I get into this, I did want to say, um, Alejandra really touched on a lot of the major data points that, that, that really are at the core of why this is important to the Latino community. We heard from her that one fifth of the labor force is going to, is going to be Latino by 2030, which is not an insignificant portion. So we know the Latino community is, is making a, making up a growing portion of the U.S. workforce. We know Latino workers are overrepresented in industries with high illness and injury rates and frequently face occupational health and safety hazards, including accidents, um, injuries, and fatalities. Um, during the pandemic, we know that Latinos were disproportionately employed in occupations that were affected by COVID, were twice as likely to contract or die from COVID-19, and three times as likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 um, in comparison to their non-Latino white counterparts. And so, um, it's a big issue. It's a very important issue to our community. Um, while Latino workers employed in the US come from a variety of immigration backgrounds, we do wanna like recognize that. Immigrant and migrant workers are especially likely to be employed in dangerous industries, such as those in food systems, for example, we're thinking meat and poultry processing, seafood processing, agriculture. Um, Many of these industries disproportionately rely on international workers recruited from Mexico and other Latin American countries to fill seasonal labor needs um, through these temporary work visas. 
And I will say these visas, um, these visa programs have drawn criticism for putting workers at risk for numerous health related um, problems, such as acute and chronic illness, injury to mental health issues, human trafficking, discrimination, um, and other issues that really have a wide impact um, on workers and their communities well being. Um, and one other key flaw if, of this program is that um, there is always a looming threat of immigration enforcement related retaliation just because of the nature of how this program is is structured. And so, for example, here, um, I did want to share briefly a, an anecdote uh, about two of our clients, Reina Alvarez and Maribel Hernandez, who, um, who were working at a crawfish plant, right, in Louisiana, um, participating in one of these programs, one of these temporary work programs. Um, when they became ill from COVID-19 and they sought medical care, their employer retaliated them um, by, and, and this cost them their jobs, right? They were fired um, and they lost their housing and their immigration status, um, all because they were trying to protect themselves. Um, and so when we think about why these collaborations are important, why it's important to bring more attention to this issue, I think first and foremost, the more knowledge there is about different aspects of a person's health, the better position we are to protect everyone's health. Um, so the general public, I think, is now recognizing worker health as public health. Um, and I think the COVID uh, pandemic was really a huge reminder that it, you know, that this is a very important issue and, and it's crucial that we make this connection. Um, collaborative efforts during the pandemic, I think, helped us all pool limited resources and um, expertise to help um, not just raise awareness, but also share learnings amongst each other, amongst advocates um, and with the communities that we're serving. Um, with this increasing awareness, there are more opportunities to advocate for policies that will help bolster worker protections um, so that workers can protect themselves and advocate for improvements as workplaces and contexts evolve. And so I won't mention all of them, but a few key ones that I think we learned are really important during the pandemic are uh, paid leave, uh, paid job protected family and medical leave. Um, expansion to for migrant workers access to health care, workers comp and legal services um, and, and protections for whistleblowers. So people who are, um, you know, advocating for changes in the workplace. And so um, and one other final note that I will share before I wrap up, um, being a part of a collaboration such as, you know, one um, through a cooperative agreement with the CDC, we had the opportunity to formalize and um, work with partners who were um, uh, in different areas that we didn't cover, <clears throat> excuse me, um, geographic areas that we didn't cover and had already lasting trusting relationships with their communities. And so again, we created this feedback loop to, sh to share with each other what we were hearing, what people's concerns were, what, what, throughout the pandemic, shared that with local health departments and the CDC and vice versa, shared the most critical updates to these communities. So I think um, being part of collaboration help, helps us multiply that impact in a way that we probably wouldn't have individually. Um, and finally, I'll just leave my contact information as well as my colleague, Julia Coburn, who again, led uh, the drafting effort um, for worker health on behalf of CDM. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was an excellent overview. And I really appreciated you chiming in about certain workers' stories and how that has influenced your work and how that is going to just help us lead forward in this advocacy and raising more awareness about worker health in the future as we do grow into the one fifth of the worker force, which is completely wild and as you said is not um, a small number. Um, so I just want to thank you and then pass the mic to our final speaker, Cerise, uh, who is joining us from Vaccinate Your Family once again um, and will talk to us about infectious disease and how that has impact on the Latino community. So thank you. Take it away, Cerise. Thank you, Alejandra, and thank you to Paulina and Carmen for such really wonderful, insightful presentations. So I'm going to be talking to you about, surprise, vaccines <laughs> um, and the importance of vaccines. So our, um, our goal here is just to kind of provide a high level overview. And I do want to give credit also to two of my colleagues, 
that helped put together this presentation. Uh, Grizel Sinieros and Marlene Ramirez, um, they were responsible also for the cultural review of this. So next slide, please. So just to um, familiarize some of you who may not be familiar with Vaccinate Your Family, um, we are a national nonprofit organization. We've actually been around for over 30 years, and our mission is to protect people of all ages from vaccine preventable diseases. Um, we really want to ensure that there is equitable access, not only to vaccine services, but also to evidence-based information about vaccines. Next slide, please. So why do we vaccinate? There are so many reasons why. Um, number one, to keep people healthy. I know myself, you know, it's it's not necessarily something I, I think about all the time, but when I think about why I personally vaccinate, I want to live a healthy lifestyle. Vaccines help prevent disease, death, and disability. And when we talk about vaccines, I think there is a general notion that we get vaccinated and we shouldn't get sick. And ideally that would be the case. But what's really important is not only the prevention of illness, but vaccines are really good at helping to prevent serious outcomes like hospitalization, death, and disability. We also vaccinate to save time and money, right? They are an important part of our preventative health care. Nobody wants to get sick. We lose time from work, um, spending time at school, fun with family and friends. It's just not fun to be sick. And we know that when we're sick, um, that absolutely can have economic um, repercussions as well. And we vaccinate to keep diseases from spreading. So we know that the more people that are vaccinated in the community, the less that disease can spread. And then lastly, we also should hopefully be, be vaccinated, be vaccinating, excuse me, to protect those who can't get vaccinated themselves, whether that's due to their age, allergies, medical conditions, et cetera. So I like to say that vaccination is a team sport. Getting vaccinated for me personally is not just about protecting myself. It's also about protecting my loved ones, my friends, my family, my community. Um, and I will say that um, at the top of the introductions, Alejandra did mention that I have a personal story. Unfortunately for me, vaccines are important, not only professionally, but personally as well. I actually lost my healthy five-year-old son, Joseph, to flu during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. And Joseph's story is not unique. There are a lot of stories like Joseph's, um, be it flu, COVID, meningitis, you name it. Um, all of these vaccine preventable diseases unfortunately have impacted people. And that's why we need to really tell these stories so that hopefully we can prevent this from happening to other people. Next slide, please. So who do we vaccinate? Children? adolescents, young adults, pregnant people, older adults, pretty much everyone. Certainly we know that there are people who again, can't be vaccinated, um, but vaccines are really needed across the lifespan. I think it's easy for us to think about kids and the fact that, oh my gosh, they need their vaccines. But then we get to be adults and we forget that we need vaccines across our lifespan as well. Again, to hopefully leave long, healthy, productive lives. Next slide, please. So when do we vaccinate? So many of you may have seen these before, um, the CDC um, immunization schedules. There are different ones for children, adults, um, and then other categories as well. But the CDC vaccine recommendations included in these immunization schedules identify which vaccines we need at different times in our life. Um, again, to hopefully help us stay healthy. So these schedules are developed by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, also known as ACIP. And ACIP provides those recommendations to the CDC, and the CDC is the one who sets these immunization schedules. And beyond just CDC, these schedules are also approved by other medical societies and experts, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as others. Next slide, please. So let's talk about vaccination barriers just for the general population, just for a moment. So we know vaccination barriers are plentiful. 
And there is no shortage of those. But three big ones really fall into three categories. So the World Health Organization came up with what they call this 3C model, confidence, complacency, and convenience. So the, this model suggests that vaccine hesitancy emerges when, number one, individuals lack confidence in the safety and or effectiveness of the vaccine, as well as the people who are recommending and providing the vaccines. So complacency, some people just simply think that they don't believe these diseases are, are serious. They don't think that they are at risk. And beyond that, they don't think vaccination is necessarily required to prevent these diseases. And they may also think that the um, potential risks associated with vaccination outweigh the benefits of vaccination. And then the third category, convenience, really pertains to access. Do people think that going to get vaccinated is convenient, comfortable, or affordable? Next slide, please. So let's talk about specifically the burden of disease in Latinos. I know Paulina and Carmen both um, indicated that we know um, the data show that Hispanic Hispanic, excuse me, or Latino people are disproportionately affected by infections, hospitalizations, and death. For example, there are plenty of data showing that is the case for COVID-19 and flu. And we know this structural racism has led to health inequities. So as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Hispanic communities have experienced significant economic disparities, including higher levels of food insecurity, housing disruption, and job loss. And while some barriers to vaccination remain the same for all populations, Latinos have experienced a magnified burden of disease due to these health inequities. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, vaccination disparities in Latinos. So let's talk about this in a little bit more depth. Um, so this is certainly not a comprehensive list. It's some of the ones that contribute most to these disparities that we're seeing. So number one, a lack of access to healthcare and insurance. Number two, a higher prevalence of underlying medical conditions. And misinformation, gosh, that's a big one for everybody, but certainly we know that that is something that pertains to Latinos as well. And I think this is a really big one too, um, lack of culturally and linguistically appropriate educational resources. Um, and then last but not least, and certainly this list is not in a hierarchy, um, but sometimes there are just simply missed opportunities to vaccinate. If someone does have a primary healthcare provider, that healthcare provider may be missing opportunities to vaccinate people during routine medical appointments. Um, there's a quote I always think of, um, Patsy Stinchfield, um, who is a member of the National, Infectious for Fun um, National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, always says she is um, a healthcare provider. She has been one for a very long time, but she says we really need to make every visit every healthcare visit, a vaccine visit, meaning that everybody falls behind or can fall behind in, the, in staying up to date on their routine immunizations. So we really need to think about where are those opportunities? Um, and just to echo again what Paulina and Carmen said, housing and occupational risk factors contribute to these disparities too, such as living in multi-generational households and no paid leave. You know, if, if you think about it, someone wants to go get vaccinated or they're sick, they may not have the luxury of having paid leave. So then they have to make some really difficult economic decisions for themselves and their families. Next slide, please. So let's just talk for a moment about resources, because this is something that we take really seriously here at Vaccinate Your Family. Um, and what you see on the screen here is just an example of some of the assets that we have in our seasonal flu um, toolkit. So part of the barriers that lead to the disparities are, again, this lack or general lack of culturally and linguistically appropriate materials. So how can we overcome some of these disparities? One way is to use culturally tailored approaches. So this example here, um, and if you go to the URL on the bottom and I'll pop it in the chat in a moment, um, what we did with our seasonal flu campaign is we put together this toolkit for social media and it is bilingual. 
available in English and Spanish because we know that not everybody has the resources or the bandwidth to put together these resources, but you want to get these messages out to your audiences. So this is one way that we wanted to make that available to our partners. Um, we have this as well as other Spanish language resources on the Vaccinate Your Family website. And I will say also, I just want to give one really quick brief shout out to, um, I know some of you on our webinar today are promotores and, and community health workers. And we also have um, what we call a vaccination community navigator program. And again, I'll pop the link into the chat in a moment. But that is um, a four-part core curriculum really aimed at community health workers and promotories, kind of leading them through um, to gain the information needed to address some of these disparities that we've talked about today. Next slide, please. So really quickly, because I know we're at time, I just want to show a couple other resources that we have at Vaccinate Your Family. Um, these are our eBooks. We have one for childs and teens. Um, and one also on the following slide for adults. And these are digital resources that can be downloaded. You can have them if you just want a handy guide. Um, they are certainly helpful in navigating some of these conversations that we have with other folks. Next slide, please. And this is just our adult ebook. Next slide. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight some trusted sources of information. Again, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but there are some Spanish resources on here as well. And next slide, just wanted to wrap up by giving you um, my contact information. Always really thankful for the partnerships that we have here at Vaccinate Your Family um, with folks in the community. Um, so please do feel free to reach out to us. And certainly um, feel free to visit our website and follow us on social media if you are not already. And with that, I will hand it back to Alejandra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cerise. It's such a plethora of information on why vaccines are so essential to our communities um, and how we can really use some resources to broaden our reach on motivating more people to vaccinate. So I really appreciate that. Um, as I've mentioned in the chat and has been brought up multiple times, this is now our Q&A session. Um, and so we'd really encourage all our audience members to pop questions in the chat as you see fit that I will be facilitating this conversation with our speakers here today. Um, so I just wanted to first start with one of the questions that I saw earlier in the chat that was directed to Paulina about the Luchad campaign. Um, Emily from the Illinois Public Health Association uh, she wanted to know, how do you reach and collect stories from those uh, without access to the internet or technology? I love that question. Thank you so much for asking that because that was actually something, and just, just to be real for a second here, that was something that we really had to figure out as well. We had to really sit down with some of our partners in different communities. And I think a good example actually is um, in Yuma, Arizona. I'm not sure if we have any of our partners from Yuma with us uh, this morning, but um, some of the communities that they work with are, are very much out there. And even when we went to the clinics in person, they were, they were out there. They were nowhere near, um, you know, the metropolitan areas. I mean, they're drive. And so <clears throat> I think initial initial answer to your question is just meeting them where they are. And I think that's something that we, we've we heard a lot, right, during the pandemic, where it's like, we just had to meet them where they are. And um, that's kind of the, the, the short and sweet of it. We really just had to go to those neighborhoods with, and it was usually um, in collaboration with a church or a local clinic or a community health center. Again, it's a trusted area, a trusted, building or organization in that community for us to sit down and say, you know what, we're going to have some cafecito, some pan dulce, we're here to talk. And many times that's what worked, um, really just coming and meeting them where they were. There were some cases, I think, where we probably could have maybe gone further out. And I think, you know, this is something that maybe Carmen mentioned in her presentation that, you know, especially when you're dealing with, you know, certain uh, types of workers, right? Like, so if you're working with farm workers, 
PTO is not quite something you easily come by, right? So meeting them where they are actually means going to where they're working in the fields. And so we unfortunately did not have the chance to meet them in those in those particular settings. But because of partners like CDM and others, we were able to hear stories from farm workers. And so I think there's there's so much room for being able to figure out how we can meet certain communities and different neighborhoods where they are. But really, that's how we were able to get some of those stories and really hear from people that you may not normally hear from in a webinar or on a story link. Um, and we were able to just sit down and hear directly from families. And so I hope that answers your question, but we're always open to ideas and different types of collaborations to continue to find those stories that need to be heard. Absolutely. And, you know, um, the whole Latinx team who are here on the webinar can contest to just the extent that Polina has gone to to talk to people and really get to grasp their stories and want to do them justice. And so um, I think it was really important that Polina herself was there uh, navigating those conversations and being there in person and um, collaborating with public health departments and local community organizations um, like CDM and others. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing how you reach those harder to reach communities. Um, I do have another question also uh, for Cerise. Um, I know that you mentioned all these beautiful shared resources. I'm just wondering, um, what are the like best channels that you've used to these resources on trying to be more culturally competent and which ones are most successful that you think have reached Latino communities and probably more about these harder to reach communities who are struggling with the three C's of um, vaccine hesitancy? I think that that's an excellent question and it really goes back to partnering with folks like Latinx Voices and Dia de la Mujer Latina in Texas. And I know who Lisa Soto is on here as well. I mean, it's really about trans creation and working with these communities and then utilizing the trusted messengers. So as an example, I'll talk a little bit more about our vaccination community navigator program that I just really quickly highlighted during my presentation. But we know that community health workers and promotories our trusted messengers in their community, right? So that is really one avenue that we've seen using our partnerships, amplifying things through that network to empower the trusted messengers who can then engage in that outreach in their community. So I think that has really been, as far as the Latino community, one of the most striking success stories that we've had here at Vaccinate Your Family. Excellent. Yes, the power of partnership, I think, is really coming through in this whole uh, webinar and throughout the whole series, I think, obviously, as um, we've garnered our partnerships with other communities um, and created these stories to be put into the Luchat initiative. Um, and so I do have a question for Carmen as well. Um, similarly, like what progress have you seen in your years in working in this space that um, are just the most successful in uh, reaching more maybe policymakers or other advocacy uh, institutions that are um, really fighting for more worker health benefits and policy? So what are the success stories or what are the most successful avenues that your organization or that you've seen um, implemented? Thank you. Um, I I think first and foremost, um, identifying the opportunities there are for advocacy. Um, sometimes it could be something a little bit bit more innocuous. Like, uh, I'll give a very specific example. Um, we uh, in the last year and a half, especially, um, are are seeing how. Um, the public health emergency for the pandemic has come to an end. There's a lot of confusion about what resources were going to be remaining accessible for communities who don't, who can't afford to really pay out of pocket for vaccines or treatment options. Um, and so once we were nearing, we were hearing from the news, oh, you know, Biden administration is, is going to um, end the public health emergency soon before he officially ended it. Um, we had a lot of concerns. So we we um, spoke to the folks that we've been in touch with, our partners and um, some workers we've been in touch with um, throughout the pandemic asked, you know, what are your concerns? As you're hearing this from the news, as you're, as you're wondering, you know, 
uh, evaluating what the situation is like in, in the public health sphere, right? Because it affects all of us. Um, evaluating what you're going to do to protect your loved ones. What are um, your concerns? And so we took those concerns and we had an opportunity through um, ACIP, uh, which now I'm, I'm going to forget what it stands for, but basically in the CDC, it's, it's a committee that's in charge of immunizations, right? Of making um, recommendations uh, related to immunizations. Um, and we provided some recommendations recommendations to preserve access to COVID vaccines um, for communities that probably don't have access to insurance, worker-provided work, um, work provided insurance. And um, uh, I think we were able to at least bring that to the attention um, for folks who maybe aren't as aware of how this is going to impact um, uh, certain communities that um, don't have the resources to pay for those things out of pocket. And then on the, the federal level, I think there's... Um, for particularly for the issues that we work on, there's very limited, I think, opportunities to advance protections. We're always constantly on the defense trying to um, prevent from um, the federal government from expanding these these um, work programs so that it's a free for all people, you know, um, work employers can, you know, use um, folks um, uh, to come to the U.S. to work and then people are seen as expendable, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so um, there have been recently some opportunities for, for advancing protections. And I think um, we're taking advantage of these opportunities and really trying to loop workers in as much possible. Because I think, you know, I, I forget who, who said this first, but the people who are affected by the problem are the ones who are closest to the solution and really trying to make that connection and have people's um, voices heard. So that way um, we can actually make some meaningful um, uh, reforms to these programs. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing the uh, whole strategy and how it developed. And I appreciate you highlighting the importance of defensive and not just offensive advocacy, because it's kind of wild to think that some people in policy aren't always fully aware of just the necessary like bare minimum that needs to keep going in order for us to build on the foundation and hopefully like we can't we can't build when the world underneath us is shaking and, and already kind of un unraveling so I appreciate you highlighting that aspect um I do want to thank you all, uh, your speakers here for being here. I wanted to give you just a minute or two, each of you to give some last minute thoughts, or if you have questions for each other, this would be an excellent time to share that. So I'll just start with uh, Paulina. Uh, do you have any last minute things to share? And then if you have any questions for our fellow speakers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alejandra. And thank you again to Carmen and Cerise. Um, I, I think just as in closing, I just want to say, again, a big thank you to everyone that's on the call. I know that every one of us has worked tirelessly um, throughout the pandemic to address the needs of our community. And we, as a task force, want to stand with you and stand alongside you in however we can in your community. So um, really, this is just a chance for us to continue that collaboration. We don't want to see the momentum around health equity in addressing Latino-specific concerns dwindle beyond, um, beyond how much it already has, right? We want to continue to see that momentum increase. And so only together can we do that. Somos más fuertes unidos. And I'm just looking forward to working together, even though we're hitting the holiday season in a, in a bit, in a few weeks, um, please let us know how we can continue to support the work you do together in 2024. Amazing. And I wanted to allow Cerise also to have any sh closing thoughts. Gosh, I am just so impressed by everything everyone is doing. Um, I, I want to share a message of empowerment because it's something that I remind myself of every day. And having lost my son to flu, you know, certainly, again, I have that personal professional connection to vaccination and public health. But I really want to I want us all to think that each one of us individually and collectively can make a difference. You know, a lot of these conversations that we have around vaccines are tough. They're tough for me. They're tough for all of us. But just that one person at a time approach, right? We are all doing such wonderful things and we're reaching thousands, if not hundreds of thousands and millions of people. But sometimes it's those small, intimate conversations where we're saving a life. So I just wanted to have that message of empowerment to end with. 
That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I'll lastly hand the mic to Carmen for any final thoughts. Thank you. I think, um, Cerise, I think I echo what you're saying about the importance of individual conversations. I think it's something that we've really been reminded of as, as we face a lot of challenges in messaging and communications and trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. It's really the one-on-one -on -one conversations and understanding what people's concerns are, um, what their priorities are. That's really gotten us way more <laughs> ahead of, of the conversation than just like, you know, just sticking with our our talking points. So I um, just want to echo that. Um, I will say um, I'll also share an opportunity to take action for folks who are interested in migrant workers. And um, it's, it's just a really timely opportunity to speak up and share any um, stories or um, if you want to share any comments directly about um, what you think um, could be improved. Um, and I'll share more context through the through an email um, link. But I just want to uh, thank Latinx Voices for inviting us. Um, thank you all for participating participating in this webinar and um, just hope that you, you take the message of uh, worker health is public health to your communities. Yes, worker health is public health. Thank you so much. I will just share some final slides here. Um, I think it was excellent that Carmen ended with saying, share your story because your story does matter to us. Um, there is a form that Latinx has for you to share your story, how little or how as much as you want to share. We also um, encourage our partners, you know, Cerise and Carmen to put any links that you have that are relevant to your stories as well. And we can share those with each other. Um, I do also want to remind everyone that we will have a third webinar and our final one in this series. It is uh, scheduled for Tuesday, November 14th at 3 p.m. Central or 4 p.m. Eastern. The registration link is to come and more details from us will be shared along with the recording of this webinar and any links that we've shared throughout this webinar. So don't worry if you didn't get a chance to link them and save them in your bookmarks. Uh, we will have those available to you. Um, I also wanted to just take a moment of pause um, as Paulina mentioned, the holidays are coming, but a special one for our Latino communities is really just later this week uh, for Dia de los Muertos. So we've been talking a lot about COVID-19 and how that's impacted our communities. Um, so I wanted to just have a moment of pause to honor those who we have lost from the pandemic um, and any other situations or other loved ones that we have lost recently. So... Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I hope that you stay happy and healthy and we really appreciate all your support. Please keep in touch. Um, you've been an amazing, amazing group to talk with. So thank you so much.